coming out today. Uh, I'm Randy Roberts, as Bill mentioned, the Assistant Curator for Midwest Museum of American Art. Uh, if you haven't been to the museum before, I encourage you all to go uh, and check out to see what we have to offer. Uh, this Friday we're opening a new exhibit, uh, Politics and Religion. Uh, it's very timely for this year, uh, but I am here to speak to you today a little bit about historic uh, Hoosier women artists. Uh, and I'd like to first begin by just simply putting that women have always been art makers and there have always been Hoosier women in the arts. And many women could have been discussed today uh, for their contributions, but I chose to focus, given the time frame, from 1890 to 1915, or 1950. And I also chose these women based on having similar backgrounds, similar training. Uh, most of them were unmarried, progressive women. Uh, they came from families who were, uh, had an artistic background, carpentry, uh, house painting, textile design. And I didn't make limitations based on uh, any one style or where they lived or how long they lived in Indiana. And finally, I selected these women based on the principle of their artwork being woman-made, uh, which quickly became a theme among all of the women presented. Yeah. A bit flicked yeah. off. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, so as women artists, and particularly women from Indiana, these women defy the ethos of their day and instead chose what was right for them. And given the social, political, and geographic norms of their generation, women like Marie Gaugh and Janet Scudder and the enterprising Overbeck sisters achieved unprecedented odds, and many of them made history and would go down as women of firsts. But it took guts to be an artist. Uh, today, then, men and women, both. Uh, but for women in the 19th through the early 20th century, uh, scholars June Bois and Rachel Berenson Perry describe that only a, women, a woman driven by some inexplicable inner force could have taken herself seriously enough to be a professional artist. But by the 1890s, um, an acceptability of women in the arts was becoming a norm. And it was made possible by the wives of wealthy barons like Bertha Palmer, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, and Isabella Stewart Gardner, uh, who sponsored artists as patrons. And it was also made possible by intellectual progressive women who formed civic clubs uh, and organizations with the intent of advancing a genteel woman's occupation like Mary Wright Sewell. Uh, and Mary Wright Sewell was from Indianapolis, and in 1888, she was one of 18 women to form a stock company to finance the construction of the building for the Indianapolis Women's Club. And the Women's Club uh, had a mission. Uh, their mission was to provide a center of cultivation for the public and particularly the women of Indianapolis for their literary, artistic, scientific, industrial, musical, mechanical, and educational purposes. So the location became known as the Propyleum, and it was the first of its kind uh, for its day. Ownership was limited to women, membership was limited to women, it was a woman's only thing. And among all of the clubs and organizations that this building housed, uh, the most pivotal was the Art Association of Indianapolis. And the association also served as the Indianapolis Museum of Art and became a launching pad for many women to become professional artists as it later became the John Heron Art Institute in 1902. So sorry, my dying. This man. <laughs> uh, so this building is no longer there, um, and it was 
moved to a new location in the 1920s, uh, which is still in operation. Another one of the 18 women uh, joining Sewell was Susan Merrill Ketchum, and she went on to organize the first exhibition for the Art Association. Uh, as the Art Association of Indianapolis became the John Heron Art Institute, it continued to be a place of inclusion. Uh, it was open to women artists, as Indianapolis was a new town, so you know there were new opportunities uh, for its people. But it was also a popular place because the core faculty uh, were the Hoosier group, and they provided a diverse curriculum based on their recent experiences uh, just coming back from Munich. Uh, one early Hoosier woman artist who had ties with the Art Association was Alice Woods Bullman. Uh, her preliminary education took place in Indianapolis, but she also went to study in New York and in Europe. Uh, she was an illustrator, of course, but she was also a novelist, and her writing was based on her own uh, experiences as a progressive woman. And she incorporated her artwork into her novels to illustrate the point of it being totally woman-made. But Indianapolis wasn't the only option available for a growing group of Hoosier women who were interested in professional art training. Mid Midwestern art schools located in Cincinnati and in Chicago had a growing reputation for inclusion compared to the elite academies of the East Coast and those in Europe. And this is uh, Fred Dumanac with his students, uh, which you can see a large group of them are women. Uh, and he was a, an art leader in Cincinnati. Uh, but for sculptor uh, Janet Scudder, Chicago was also a destination of choice as it was the host city for the much anticipated Columbian Exposition. And there's Janet Scudder. And Janet Scudder was born in Terre Haute and studied at the Art Institute of Chicago. She was a suffragette and would go on to design the Indiana Bicentennial Medal in 1916. She traveled extensively through Europe um, and re was received by many influential people like Rockefeller and Gertrude Stein. But while she was in Chicago, Janet Scudder was also one of the White Rabbits in Laredo Taft's studio. Laredo Taft was the chief sculptor for the Columbian Exposition and at the time was very concerned that he wasn't going to have enough time or help in producing all of the sculptures needed for the fair. So reluctantly, the chief architect of the expo, Daniel Burnham, agreed to hiring an all-women team. So there weren't enough men available in Chicago to make these sculptures. Uh, so reluctantly, Daniel Burnham agreed to do that, and the women were thus labeled the white rabbits of the white city. And she did most of the sculptures uh, for the whole horticulture building at the fair. But as an independent professional artist, Scudder was known for her classical fountains and memorial plaques. In 1912, the New York Times proclaimed her as one of the foremost women sculptors in America, despite her opposition to distinct categorical references. But Hoosier women also opted to study in New York with the socially respected artist William Merritt Chase. Chase was a fellow Hoosier, and his studio was a popular choice for women as it was a totally co-educational setting. Often art schools that claimed co-educational, or that they were co-educational, just simply meant they were offering admission, but there were still quite a bit of conditions. Uh, women, if you were privileged enough to join a man in the same room, you were in the back of the room. Uh, you were in separate classes from men, and often tuition was greater for the woman than for the man. Um, and it wasn't even until 1877 that women were allowed to draw the male figure. 
but not in its physical form, uh, a plaster cast or some kind of reproduced version uh, with a fig leaf attached. <laughs> So those, who's, those Hoosier women who studied with William Merritt Chase uh, were Marie Goff, Lucy Taggart, and the earlier mentioned Susan Merrill Ketchum. So Marie Goff was a native of Indianapolis and studied at Heron prior to her time under Chase's tutelage. She was from a family of artists which included Hoosier group painter Otto Stark. And Marie Goff was primarily known and interested in portraiture. Uh, her portraits included many literary celebrities of the day, artistic celebrities as well, uh, like T.C. Steele and George McCullo, um, as well as James Whitcomb Riley. But she was very interested in describing the personality of her sitter and communicating that to the viewer. And this was a technique that could have only been learned in William Merritt Chase's studio. And she was also the first female artist to receive an official portrait commission from an Indiana governor. In 1952, Goth was selected to paint Henry F. Stryker's portrait to hang in the state capitol building. When she died in 1975, she bequeathed her est entire estate to the Brown County Art Guild, whom she had been a charter member since the 1920s. And Lucy Taggart, who was also from Indianapolis, was from a very uh, politically connected family. And after a brief period at Heron, she studied with William Merritt Chase, where she learned the fast brush technique uh, taught in Chase's studio, and that was a technique that basically describes one continuous line in a painting where there's no brush strokes visible. And all of her biographies uh, suggest that she kind of downplayed her talent, that she didn't really think she was a very well-versed or well-trained, sophisticated artist. But I think that that's not true, and that it's clearly demonstrated uh, by her versatility. Most artists, when they become professional, they only want to master one thing. So, uh, but she spent the last 30 years of her career teaching at Heron, so went full circle. And Susan Merrill Ketchum, uh, who was mentioned earlier as a founding member of the Art Association of Indianapolis, also studied with Chase. Um, this is one of her most uh, famous portraits, study of a hat, and in a dimmer light you would be able to notice that the light is really, or the hat is really just an outline um, and not really there at all. So your immediate focus goes to her portrait, or to her face, and what she's saying is, I am a woman artist, I am serious, I am well groomed, and I know what I'm doing. So it's kind of a joke referring that to the hat as not being very important after all. So as the world advanced towards World War II, the modern aesthetic took full flight, and it can be seen in the later work of Dorothy Moreland. Uh, and these are a couple of paintings by Dorothy Moreland uh, that are on view at the Museum, or will be on view at the museum later this year. Dorothy Moreland was a landscape painter from Irvington and studied with John Otis Adams and William Forsyth at Heron. As a mature artist, Moreland preferred to paint in her studio for memory, and painting for mem memory allowed her to recreate the landscape based on her personal experience. So this distance she placed between memory and direct observation gave her work a decisively modern edge. Simple shapes and pools of color characterized this gesture to modernism. So as the modern aesthetic became the new look, Hoosier ceramic artist Becky Brown fused abstract elements into her ceramic work 
Um, some are biomorphic, containing human and animal references. Some are just decorative geometric shapes. Uh, these are also on view at the Midwest Museum. And Becky Brown is also known. Uh, she was married to the famous Karl Marx, uh, who taught ceramics uh, for a very long time at IU Bloomington. But the Overbeck sisters from Cambridge City, Indiana, preceded Becky Brown. The Overbecks opened the first woman-owned ceramics or arts and crafts pottery studio in their home in 1911. Margaret Overbeck, who was the oldest sister and had uh, the most worldly experience in the arts, originally conceived the idea of opening a studio but died the same year <coughs> before it was able to really take fruition. While all of the sisters made ceramics and worked collaboratively, each of them had their own special role in the studio. <coughs> Hannah was known for her design work, Elizabeth was a technician, and Harriet, who is referred to, who I kind of refer to as the manager, kept the house clean, kept them fed, and probably, you know, stopped them from bickering as there was work to keep doing and to get the work done. And speaking of work, production was often slow since everything was handmade and the product of experimentation. They relied on experimentation so that their work would not be imitated or imitated by anyone, but that it would be a unique, one-of-a-kind piece only found in Cambridge City. And uh, Mary Frances's addition to, to the studio uh, she developed the idea of creating these little novel figurines based on Tom characters in, in, the, in Cambridge City as an additional source of income while they were working on their larger commissions that she referred to as the humor of the kiln. <laughs> So this is uh, an example of one of Mary Frances's figurines. Um, as I mentioned, she based these off of town characters. They were very popular with people in that town because you could go to the the, the strange ladies' homes and you could, you could get your own portrait. Um, an example of Hannah's uh, design, the pattern, as well as some of the commission pieces uh, by the sisters. So the Overbeck Studio was a woman-owned and operated business. Uh, the Overbeck Studio was totally self-sufficient. They did not rely on anything ready-made as per the arts and crafts method. Everything made, everything that they created was of their own hand. They dug their own clay, made their own glaze formulas, fashioned their own designs, and hand-built their own forms. But the popularity of their ceramics stems from their inventive techniques that have been taken to the grave. Reportedly, Mary Frances, the last surviving Overbeck sister, destroyed their notes so that nothing could be recreated before she died in 1955. And finally, I just want to close uh, by saying that there are many more women to cover. There are more, many more names to cover. And it's important to remember that women have always been in the arts and that there have always been Hoosier women in the arts. But it's also important to consider that this topic could be taken one step further to include women artists who are working in the contemporary present who are working in different mediums than we didn't even look at today. Um, one such as uh, Kay West Hughes of South Bend, who is a photographer um, and a folklorist. And she is interested in how the rural traditions of small India, Indiana towns are interpreted and transformed in the present day and how they may meet those needs or how they don't meet those needs.
So the Hoosier women presented today, they were navigators. They were business oriented and entrepreneurs. While many of these women became women of first or recognized to have achieved some kind of victory uh, over others, there were also women who used their place in society to become leaders, collectors, uh, patrons, and museum founders of some of this country's best attractions. And that's what I'm going to close.